What can you tell us about the scale of anti-war demonstrations in Russia? Well, earlier this week, there were thousands of people who came out onto the streets all over the country, more than 50 cities across Russia. Uh, there were nearly 2,000 arrests made in, in one single evening as, as people all over this country are saying, not in our name, this is not our war. And this is a very important message that I hope is heard around the world. This is not Russia's war. This is not the war by the people of Russia or the people of Ukraine. This is yet another military adventure by the unaccountable, unelected, authoritarian, and frankly, increasingly deranged dictator in the Kremlin by the name of Vladimir Putin. And it's not just the thousands of Russians who have been protesting, despite the threat and a very real risk of arrest and, 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 and everything else that can, can happen if you're opposing the Putin regime here, but uh, also Russia's leading cultural figures, uh, writers, scientists, uh, sports people, journalists have been adding their voices over these past few days uh, to the growing protest here in Russia against uh, Putin's war. Well, I was going to ask you, who are the protesters? Are they simply students and intellectuals, which we've seen a lot of in the past? No, the protesters, it is true that they are mostly young, and I think this is a very important sign because Vladimir Putin is, is going to turn 70 this year, and those Russians who are coming out to protest against his regime and against this war that he's unleashed are mostly young people, and they are the future of Russia, and he isn't. Today is the uh, seventh anniversary of the assassination of Russian opposition leader Boris Nemtsov, who was gunned down literally in front of the Kremlin walls in Moscow. Well, you were, in fact, a close associate of Mr Nemtsov, and uh, I guess this says that there is a price to pay for protesting in Mr Putin's Russia. You yourself, I think, have faced reprisals. Well, I've been poisoned twice by operatives of the uh, Russian FSB, the Federal Security Service, the same operatives who, who later poisoned Alexei Navalny. There were a series of media investigations uh, led by uh, Bellingcat, actually a London-based media group that has uh, conducted this you know, amazing investigative journalism and actually uncovered the names of the operatives of Putin's FSB uh, that uh, you know the go-around killing uh, political opponents of the Putin regime. Both Alexei Navalny uh, and I were fortunate. You know, when I was lying in a coma uh, here in hospital in Moscow after the poisoning, uh, doctors told my wife that I had about a 5% chance to survive. I, I cannot uh, tell you enough how grateful I am to have made that 5%. But, you know, Boris Nemtsov did not even have 1% chance when that Russian interior ministry officer shot him in the back on that bridge in front of the Kremlin. Every year, thousands of people come to that bridge to, to lay flowers, to, to light candles, to pay their respects. This year, for the first time, uh, the authorities here have made it clear that they will not be allowing the memorial event. Uh, of course, you know, nothing can prohibit and nobody can prohibit me from going to pay respects to the memory of my slain friend. So I will, of course, be going to the bridge to, to lay flowers, whatever happens. The West has decided that uh, the best path to changing Mr. Putin's behaviour is to attack his personal wealth uh, and standing. Uh, can you give us an idea of basically just how rich is Putin and um, where did that come, money come from? Well, Mr. Putin has for a long time now been described by various media organizations and experts as probably the richest man in the world. And I very well can believe that because don't forget the regime that Putin established here in Russia is not just authoritarian, but it's also kleptocratic, you know, from the classic definition of kleptocracy ruled by thieves. Uh, and of course, what those people like to do, the people who are in and around the Kremlin, is to steal the money here from our people in Russia and then stash it away and spend it in Western countries, in Western banks, Western jurisdictions, Western financial institutions, where that money is protected by the very same rule of law that they are denying our own people here in Russia. What would happen if this actually did change his behaviour? Um, it is possible that he might be compelled to realise that he's miscalculated and that he now needs to back off. But I think some experts also say uh, that it is entirely possible that he might realise he's miscalculated and simply double down. I think trying to predict what uh, Vladimir Putin will do is by this stage more in the realm of psychoanalysis than political analysis, so it's, it's uh, difficult, if not impossible, to say. Uh, what is uh, very clear, though, is that the international community, the free world, the community of democracy should finally, better late than never again, stand firm, stand on a position of principle against this man, against this criminal, corrupt and authoritarian regime. And what we do know from uh, the history of Russia 
is that those so-called small victorious wars uh, that are uh, launched by Russian and Soviet rulers for their own domestic political purposes and to try to divert domestic attention away from the real problems that people are facing here at home, um, those small victorious wars don't have a very good track record, frankly, and very often they actually have the effect that was the exact opposite uh, of what was intended. I mean, just think back to the Crimean War in the 19th century, how that ended for the Tsarist autocracy, the Russo-Japanese War of the early 20th century, and how that ended for the Tsarist autocracy, of course, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in the late 20th century, and what that did to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. So, um, you know, I, I mentioned already that this, this is not Russia's war. This is a, a personal military crime, a personal military adventure uh, by Vladimir Putin, yet another in the long list, uh, but you know what? This one may well prove to be his last. You're right. You quote the history. But, of course, one of the lessons of that history is that uh, uh, Russian leaders seem to try it again and again. Crimea, uh, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Chechnya, uh, Afghanistan, Crimea, again, and now Ukraine. Do you think that Putin is capable and willing uh, in any circumstances to fight this war uh, beyond Ukraine and into European territory, perhaps even on NATO territory? Well, you've already heard him actually threaten the use of nuclear weapons earlier this week. So again, this, this man is deranged, he could do anything. Uh, but I think what was also important to say is that every example you just mentioned of uh, sort of foreign aggression that Russian or Soviet rulers uh, uh, you know, it were engaged in, all those examples come from uh, the times when Russia or the Soviet Union uh, were autocratic uh, domestically. You know, in those brief periods of time when Russia was a democracy, such as, for example, in the early 1990s, uh, the Russian leadership, the Russian people stood, for example, in solidarity with the Baltic states in the early 90s when uh, the Soviet leadership tried to send tanks into Lithuania. So there's a really important lesson here that there is a direct correlation between the domestic and the foreign here in Russia, between the domestic repression and the lack of democracy here at home and the external aggression that the Kremlin engages in. There will come a time, there will come a time when the politics start changing here in Russia, when the political situation starts changing, because there are millions of people in Russia who fundamentally and categorically reject everything that the Putin regime stands for, who, wants, uh, who want Russia to become a normal, modern, democratic, European country uh, that it should be. Uh, and, you know, when that day comes, which none of us can predict, because another lesson from Russian history is that uh, major political changes uh, in Russia can happen like this, you know, suddenly and unexpectedly. When that day comes, I think that will be a very good day, not just for us here in Russia, for obvious reasons, but also for the rest of the world and for the rest of Europe.